Hello. Our book today is Every Picture Tells a Story. Every Picture Tells a Story is to be compared with our Facebook Live story, The Eyes of a Bird. Every Picture Tells a Story by Adrian Freider. Chapter 1, The Class Trip. Before you leave today, I have two important announcements to make, says Mrs. Frost. A ripple of excitement passes through the room, and Trudy's eyes sparkle as she waits expectantly to hear what her teacher has to say to the class. This Friday, we're going on a field trip to visit a touring art exhibition. So please bring these permission slips back tomorrow. Most students smile as Miss Frost passes out the slips, but some children frown. Not all of the class likes visiting art galleries. Finished with handling, handing out the slips, Miss Frost continues. The second announcement is that on the last Friday of this month, we'll be holding Grandparents Day. This time, it is Trudy's smile that switches to a frown. Miss Frost explained that those students who cannot bring grandparents can bring a parent or a friend instead. But Trudy is still downcast. She only has one living grandparent. And more and more, her grandmother lives on a small island off the coast of Norway. In each of the previous years, Trudy's next-door neighbor, Ms. Silk, has been her substitute grandmother for Grandparents' Day. Trudy knows Ms. Silk would be happy to come again, but this year she wishes she could take more and more by the hand and walk her through the classroom door. Trudy also knows that this is impossible. That evening, Trudy's parents says to her, I'm 11 years old and I hardly know more and more. There are plenty of photos, says dad, and you speak to her via the internet. But she speaks so little English, Trudy replies, and I speak so little Norwegian that I can't ask her the things I really want to know. She can't ask me the things either. Trudy lies in bed that night thinking. She does not expect more and more to physically come to Grandparents Day, but there must be another way she can introduce her to her class. If only she could figure out how. On Friday, Trudy set off for school with her lunchbox and sketch pad. Along with other students, she lines up the school parking lot ready for the trip. The class is excited, and the noise on the bus sounds like a swarm of busy bees. Before long, the bus pulls up in front of the art gallery. Whoa, the people's painter reads the reads the banner hanging over the gallery door. Miss Frost already explained to Bruegel, painted four centuries ago, and although Trudy has been looking forward to seeing the exhibition, she hopes that his paintings will not be too dark and dreary. The children line up and enter the gallery in pairs. They start at the beginning of the exhibition and walk their way through. Far from being dark and dreary, the paintings explode with life and the closer Trudy looks, the closer Trudy looks, the more she sees happening in the pictures. First, the view Bruegel's paintings of the season, seasons. These are called bird's eye view paintings, explained Mrs. Frost. At the time they were painted, few people could read and write, so Bruegel's paintings were a historical record of life in his time. Miss Frost smiles as she leads the children to a large painting on the wall at the far end of the gallery and says, Now I want to show you my favorite. The painting is called Children's Games, and it shows a street filled with people in the old European town. The canvas is so jam-packed with detail that every time Trudy looks at it, she sees different things. Small groups of children are playing games, such as knuckle bones, leapfrog, 
horsey, and blind men bluff. Some children are swinging on a post. Others are doing gymnastics. And a small boy has tied himself in a knot. Trudy stares at the painting captivated. Some of the children's games in the painting are similar to the ones children play today. While others are completely different, Trudy looks at the long dresses the girls are wearing and thinks about how difficult it must be, must have been to play in them. Before long, the other children begin to drift off to look at different paintings, but Trudy remains glued to the spot for the rest of the visit. She is amazed that so much information can be condensed into one painting. She also is intrigued by the idea that the painter has passed on all this meaningful information without using a single word. Bruegel's painting gives Trudy an idea. Chapter 2, Trudy's Amazing Idea You're quiet, says Trudy's friend Nadine, who sits next to her on the bus ride back to school. I'm thinking, replies Trudy. It must be something good because you have a smile on your face. When Trudy gets home, her mom asks, How was your field trip? Awesome! Trudy says as she gulps down a glass of milk and eats a banana in record time. She knows her mom wants to hear all about her art, the art expedition, but Trudy cannot wait to start developing her idea. In her bedroom, she tapes together four sheets of paper and then lines up her colored pencils. When she realizes in the gallery that Moore Moore is probably just as frustrated as she is about not being able to communicate with her granddaughter. Bruegel has shown Trudy how she can share all kinds of things, such as what type of house she lives in, where she goes to school, what games she plays, what is important to her, and what is not important. The best thing that Bruegel has shown her, though, is that she can share these things without words. First, Trudy stares at the blank, barren sheet of paper, not quite knowing where to start. Then she grabs a notepad and begins to make a list. The next day, after she gets home from dance class, Trudy is ready to start drawing. She puts her first list beside the blank paper and picks up a pencil. First, she images, imagines She's a bird hovering over her town. Then she draws what she sees beneath her. She draws her house in the center of the paper. She makes sure Mormor knows which bedroom is hers by drawing her face looking out the window. She makes her hair redder and wilder than usual, and she includes her freckles. When she starts drawing the plum tree in her backyard, Trudy realizes she has a problem. If she is going to illustrate what she likes to do and the places she likes to go, she will have to draw herself many times. Not to worry, I'll use artistic license, she says to herself, quoting a phrase Miss Frost often employs. It takes Trudy all weekend and the following week to complete the drawing. In addition to illustrating what is on her list, Trudy draws her pet rabbit, her dance school, her friend Nadine's pool, where she likes to swim on the weekends, and the local library. Just as she finishes the drawing, Dad walks in. He looks closely at Trudy's drawing and then says, This is an incredible drawing, Trudy. I can almost feel myself with you in all these places. It's for more more, she explains with a smile. Trudy's mom walks, to the room, walks into the room and Trudy holds up the drawing so that she can see it as well. 
Mom is equally amazed and says, she'll love it. You put so much detail in the picture. Chapter three, waiting for a reply. The next day, Trudy rolls up her drawing, slips it into a tube and mails it to Mormor. It takes about a week for mail to reach Norway and Trudy hopes Mormor will call when it arrives. At the same time, her class is preparing for Grandparents' Day, which is just 10 days away. All the students are working on their projects, which are meant to compare their own hobbies to those of their grandparents or grandparent substitutes. Trudy plans to have mom or Mormor at Plutie Trent. Trudy plans to have mom ask more more about her hobbies when more more calls next. As time passes, however, and no calls come, Trudy starts working on her project and mom asks her questions instead. What are more more's hobbies, she asks. How does she spend her time during the long Norwegian winter nights? I'll show you, mom says taking her to the two framed tapestries hanging on the hall. One of the one is a fishing boat unloading herring at the wharf. The other is of people skiing down snow-covered mountainside through tall green fir trees. Trudy has lived with these tapestries all her life, but for the first time she examines them closely. Then she looks carefully at the skiers. She can see plumes of snow flying up behind them as the race as they race down the slope. I never realized that more more may be, says Trudy, peering at all the tiny intricate stitches. They must have taken her a long time. Like many Norwegian women, your grandmother always has a tapestry in progress, mom explains, in an art form in Norway. And when I look at these, I picture my mother sitting in front of the fire stitching. When mom says this, Trudy realized how hard it must be for her mom to live apart from her own mother, and she gives her mom a hug. At school the next day, Trudy finally finishes her project, and Mrs. Frost displays it with other students' work on the large table just inside the classroom door. Then two days before Grandparents' Day, Dad asks Trudy, Have you invited Miss Silk to Grandparents' Day yet? Trudy answers, that she has not gotten around to it. Don't you think you should, Dad asks. Instead of going next door to invite Miss Silk, Trudy trudges to her room. She still has not heard from Mormor. She had hoped to introduce Mormor somehow on Grandparents' Day. Although she likes Miss Silk, Trudy has been imagining how wonderful it would be to introduce her real grandmother for so long that now she thinks I'd rather attend Grandparents' Day all by myself than go with someone who is not more more. Trudy is so agitated that she gets out a sheet of paper and starts to draw. Whereas Trudy's first drawing was joyful, the one is an expression of sadness. It shows Trudy's school and the schoolyard with students hand in hand with their grandparents. They all look happy, but Trudy draws herself standing alone looking mournful. As Trudy puts down her pencil with a sigh, the doorbell rings. For a moment, she thinks it is the phone and is sure it will be more and more calling. Then the doorbell rings a second time and she calls out to her parents, I'll get it. It turns out to be the delivery man with a large parcel for her. She's excited. She signs excitedly and the package and thanks the courier. 
What is it? Asked her mom, coming from coming to the front door. I don't know, says Trudy. But I do know it's very heavy and it comes from Norway. Trudy's mom watches as she opens the package. Trudy looks with delight, realizing her problem is now solved. Chapter 4, Grandparents' Day. More more calls later that night and asked Trudy's mom if the parcel has arrived. Yes, says mom, and Trudy's over the moon. What moon? It's a saying we use in English, Trudy mom switches and speaking Norwegian to explain the phrase. She tells Mormor that Trudy is absolutely thrilled and feels that she knows Mormor such much better than before. Mormor replies in Norwegian, please tell her the same. I'm over the moon about her drawing too, and I now know my granddaughter better. It is such a coincidence that we were both working on similar but different projects at the same time. The exchange takes time because of the translating, but when mom is through, she passes the phone to Trudy. Mormor says, thank you, in Norwegian, just as Trudy says the same thing in English, which makes them both laugh. Tell Mormor I'm taking her to Grandparents' Day, Trudy says to her mother. On Grandparents' Day, Miss Frost welcomes the grandparents, and one by one, the students introduce their guests. Trudy waits until everyone has been introduced, then raises her hand. I'd like to introduce my grandmother now, she says, but I first need an easel. Once the easel is in place, Trudy places Mormor's gift on it and lets the audience have a long look. An excited, interested Mormor that sounds like a bubbling stream runs through the room. My grandmother lives in Norway, Trudy begins. I call her Mormor, which is Norwegian for mother's mother. She can't be here in person, so she sent this instead. For those of you who can't see the details, I'd like to explain what this tapestry tells me about my grandmother. The audience listens intently as Trudy continues. Here's her house. The pitch of the roof is steep so the snow can slide off. And here's her white cat, Snuffnog, which is Norwegian for snowflake. One by one, Trudy points out the details in the tapestry, and by the time she is through, she is certain her classmates know Mormor almost as well as she does. They know the wild place where Mormor picks longonberries and makes jam. They know about the boathouse with the roofs of grass. They know the importance of the fishing boats tied up to the wharf. They can see the steep mountain peaks that Mormor looks at from her window. And they can see the huge arch bridge that joins Mormor's island to the mainland so that she does not have to cross by ferry anymore. Wait, I forgot, says Trudy. See the little Viking ship on the right? This tell me Mormor is as proud of her Scandinavian ancestry ancestry as I am. When the guests have all left, Miss Frost says, your grandmother's tapestry reminds me of Bruegel's painting. Trudy is tempted to tell her teacher about the drawing she sent more and more, but instead she just smiles and agrees. How did it go, Mom asks when she picks Trudy up from school. I think everyone liked getting to know more and more through her tapestry, says Trudy. Back at home, Trudy hangs more and more's tapestry on her bedroom wall. She stares at it for a while. Each time she looks, she discovers new things. That's a puffin, she thinks, examining the comical bird perched on the cliff's face. 
Exploring Warmore's tapestry is like a little like opening a treasure chest. As Trudy turns away from the tapestry, she spots her latest drawing sitting on her desk. She takes out her pencils and draw Mormor standing beside her, holding her hand. Next, she erases her sad expression and replaces it with a cheerful smile. That's much better, she says, grinning. Make sure you compare it to our Facebook Live, The Eyes of a Bird. It's an a realistic fiction, which means it can really happen. It could possibly, it's something that can possibly happen in real life. Realistic fiction is something that can possibly happen in real life. So make sure you compare. The more you read, the more you know, the more you know, the more you grow. Bye-bye.